Welcome to another edition of the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. My name is Randy Zellier from BackSportsPage.com, and thank you for making us a part of your week and keep growing and become a, the king of the wrestling world. We're not there yet. We're trying to get there, but what a way we can take a big step this week by welcoming in the WWE Hall of Famer, one half of the, one of the greatest tag teams of all time, Devon Dudley. That's right, one of the Dudley boys here on the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast, and we're going to talk to him about his current relationship with uh, brother Devon Devon, or, or sorry, Brother Ray, uh, Bully Ray, or whichever way you want to call it, Bubba, Bubba Ray Dudley, whichever way you want to call him. Devon is going to address what's going on with them. He's also going to talk about his wrestling school and talk about so much more, including his role with the WWE. But before we do, let's pay some bills. Let's take care and let everybody know where they can find us. You can find us all over social media, Cut Wrestling BSB, on both Instagram and Twitter, as well as on Facebook. Give our YouTube a subscribe. You know, we really can uh, use some reviews and some more. Some more love there. So if you can help us out with that, that'd be great. Thank you for again taking your time to listen to us this week. We took the week off last week, but you know what? Our pl- platforms still stayed busy. Check us out. We are on Google Podcast. We are on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio. Give us a listen. Give us a review. Let us know what you think. Let us know what we're doing. Okay. We are going to be spanning out with our great staff: Andrew Fumi, Scott Mitchell, Alyssa uh, Douglas, Jonathan Mowry, Jose Padilla. All great crew. Check them out. Check us all out here at the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. But for right now, all I have to say is, Devon, get the microphone. All right, special interview time here back on the cut. With me now, one half of what we can pretty much say is one of the greatest tag teams in professional wrestling history. Devon Dudley from the Dudley Boys. Devon, what's going on, brother? How are you? We're good, man. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Thanks for giving me a few minutes today. I know you're... Uh, you're busy and you've been uh, running around like a chicken without a head over the last uh, few months, especially now that you guys are back on the road. Yeah, in Orlando last night, so it was good to be able to do the show and come home as opposed to going back to my hotel room and just waiting. <laughs> yeah. Well, being in uh, being in Orlando is probably a lot different than being back in New York, when you, where you uh, we were spending a lot of your time back from your ECW and early days and uh, of your career. New York will always be my hometown, but I'm not going back to live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you you definitely prefer uh, the sun over the snow any day of the week. I could tell. The main reason why I left was because of that. Well, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that you've been doing a lot of training, not only just working as a producer behind the scenes with WWE, but you've also been a trainer. Uh, can you talk about what it was been like for you, uh, knowing the, the stellar career you've had in the ring, to be able to be a trainer and help develop the next set of stars that are going to be in the wrestling industry? Yeah, well, you know, it was something that Bubba and I, when we went to WWE the first time, uh, we kind of went to wrestling school. Um, that was poorly, poorly uh, uh, ran, and the organization there was very, very bad. <clears throat> and so him and I got together and said, you know what? We're no longer with WWE. We don't have that grind schedule anymore. We go to wrestling school. Yeah, let's do it. And it allowed us to be able to open it up, work for TNA at the time. And then, of course, on to Japan. So it was, you know, it was that neighbor. We saw what the new generation was being taught by these guys that basically don't have a clue on how to act in WWE or even how to basically survive in WWE. It's like, how can you go ask somebody to train you how to be in the WWE when they've never been themselves? So that was one of the key factors about me and Bubba opening up the school. But now I have the school, it's in Winter Park. It's about three minutes away from performance. I mean, and that's a plus because, you know, me working for the WWE as a producer backstage, that really works out great for me. So (laughs) (laughs) I basically love it. So when I'm done with them at my school, I send them on down to Hunter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you were recently were in WWE as far as an A-ring comp- uh, competitor up until 2016. You guys decided not to um you guys decided to sort of step away from the spotlight and go behind the scenes. What did it mean to you to have that last run with the company? You were there in the company at the at its hottest 
time in the early two, you know, early two thousands, late nineties. And you know, you just left your stamp on professional wrestling around that point. And then of course having a great year in, in TNA, but I'm talking about just in general, as the business was on such a high with the attitude era, what was that like in and out, uh, night, night, night and night out being around, uh, sell out houses every single night. What was that like? It was phenomenal. We were like, we were like gods. I mean, everywhere we went, we had to be escorted into whether it was a mall, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it was a restaurant, it was unheard of. I always said, I don't, I couldn't fathom what Michael Jackson or Madonna felt like in terms of their stardom. But I think I could say we had maybe 3% of that <laughs> during the attitude. <laughs> and uh, that was amazing. So I can only imagine what those guys went through. So, I mean, what we went through was rough. I mean, you know, again, you're out with your family. You want to be left alone. People come up and ask for autographs. I get it. The starstruck and all of that. But sometimes you just don't want to talk wrestling. And sometimes you just want to be by yourself and not have to worry about. Once you leave the road, you want to leave that on the road. But that's the, that's the life we chose in terms of being in the spotlight. And, you know, you give up that. It's not fun, but you give it up, and you know that you give it up. Some people handle it great. Some people don't, you know. Um, but just for the record, I never wanted to stop wrestling. You know, this was, it wasn't my idea to be a producer uh, backstage for WWE. I enjoy it now, uh, but it took me some years to actually embrace it and to, to like it. Um, Bubba decided during that 2016 uh, last run that the Dudley boys were not being treated fair and in terms of uh, the positions that we were. And I get it to a certain degree, but you have to understand the attitude error was gone. They were, and I even said that to him. I said, it's gone. It's not coming back. So I'm not coming back to WWE to relive the attitude error. In my opinion, in my opinion only, in terms of between the both of us, I didn't feel that way like he felt. I didn't feel like they were messing up the legacy that we chose. A title doesn't mean anything at this point in the stage of the game when you've won 24 already. <laughs> I mean, good God. So to have another title, you know, that says you're the tag team champion, at that point didn't really mean anything. What meant to me coming back to WWE was helping the younger talent out being able to pass that torch and to be able to go back to a place that I felt back in 2005 that we didn't leave the right way. Um, there was still some stuff left on the uh, table that I felt that we had to come back to WWE in order for me to finish out my career the way I wanted to. But, you know, there was a contract given to us after the first, the second run and Bubba didn't want to sign it. He wanted to do the Bully Ray character. And Vince said, no, he didn't want that. He wanted the Dudleys. He didn't want us to break up. He didn't want us that. Regardless to what we did in 2002 when we broke up, it still laid fresh in their minds that we were better as a tag team. Sure, I wanted to be, you know, in 2002 with the Reverend Devon gimmick, I felt that I got the raw end of the deal because the gimmick was going great. The people were liking it. I mean, hell, Triple H laid down in the middle of the ring for me. He didn't have to do that. He was, he was at the top of his game. But yeah. he laid down because he believed in the character. The character was getting over. I was doing vignettes with Vince in the back that he was even loving, you know? I might have stumbled um, along the way, but not enough to kill the character completely. You know, I mean, I went up against Randy Orton, John Cena, Rikishi, I mean, Val Venus, I mean, all the top stars back then, and Reverend Devon went over on all of them, including Triple H and Batista. So apparently I was doing something right. So my point to this is that although the WWE might have thought that we couldn't do it as a singles, I beg to differ, and I felt that we could have, but they didn't see it that way. So guess what? It's his sandbox. You have to play in his sandbox to go home. Well, Bubba chose to go home. So, again, I knew coming back 
we weren't going to be the top of the food chain. Although the respect that we got from the locker room was tremendous. Um, but again, at the same token, I knew my role in coming back was to help the younger talent to help get them over. And in order for that to happen, we got to lay down. We got to do things probably we don't want to do. But again, that's Vince's philosophy. That's Vince's sandbox. And you got to play the rule by his rules, regardless of how many people think he's out of touch or out of tune or what have you. It's his playground. You do what that man says. It's as simple as that. He writes the paychecks. At the end of the day, I don't go on Twitter and I don't go on Instagram to see what people are writing about the Dudley boys and go, oh, my God, they're treating us bad. I need to voice my opinion. No, I'm not going to do that because, again, as working as a producer backstage for the company, there are a lot of things that people don't see what, what, what's going on. So they assume when they do see it on TV that it's like, oh, that's garbage. You know, but no, there's things behind what, what, what we do. In other words, I'll give you a prime example. In TNA, Bubba, who was Bully Ray at the time, was supposed to wrestle James Storm. They had a great buildup, a great storyline. James Storm, it was supposed to be leading up to a pay-per-view. I forgot which one it was. It could have been Sacrifice or what have you. James Storm got hurt and was actually in the hospital, um, I think, three or four days prior to the pay-per-view event. Now, remind you, this was a big buildup. They did a great job and building that storyline up, but he couldn't wrestle. So I think James Storm beat Bubba in like 10 seconds. But again, he couldn't wrestle. And that was what we had to do in order to give them something. We didn't want to come on and say, oh, you know, due to James Storm's injuries prior to the match, we're not going to have this match. We They still went on with it, and they still did it. These are some of the things that the fans don't see. Right. And the fans shit all over the match. When they saw it, it was like, this big buildup, for this, oh, this is garbage. This is why TNA is not going anywhere. But yet they don't know what happens behind the scenes. There are certain things that are done for a reason, and that was to try to cover up the fact that James Storm was hurt. And he couldn't have a full match with Bubba. Um, but again, these are certain things that I feel that people don't understand and realize. So I never wanted to stop. I even went to them and said, hey, listen, I'm not ready to become a producer. There's still a lot left in me. And they said, well, you know the old man. You know how he is. You know, he wanted the Dudleys and Bubba didn't play fair. So, you know, we're going to give you this opportunity to be, you know, to stay with the company. So I looked at, and it was it was Triple H. And he, I said, um, do I have a choice? He said, no, not really. So <laughs> at that point, I was going through a divorce. And I would have loved to have gone back to Japan and finished my career. But going, to, going through a divorce at the time and having to travel 17, 18 hours on a plane to Japan every week was not what I wanted to do. So I had to weigh my options and say, OK, well, here we go. This is I guess I'll stay here and become a producer. And like I told you, I hated it at first. I didn't like it. Now I've grown into it and working with guys like the Usos, the New Day, you know, uh, even Ray and Dominic, um, you know, the the Viking Raiders, uh, the Bludgeons. When when um, Harper, you know, God rest his soul, uh, was in WWE with Eric, I had great um, matches with those guys in the ring with them, as well as producing their matches, and uh, Cesaro and um, Sheamus. You know, I had great, great time. And even working with Apollo as singles, I just, um, I felt that I was wrong again <laughs> and not getting the opportunity to wrestle continuously. But, you know, it is what it is. And I made a great as a producer. So, you know, when people ask me what happened with the Dudleys, well, Bubba didn't want to play fair. So, and I know Bubba will have his own opinion about, what happened but again that's the majority of it they gave us both the contract i signed it he didn't want to sign it and it, it left a bad taste in their mouth and by the time he was ready to sign it it some time had already went by I, let me give you a timeline when shane mcmahon came back in detroit um when he, he had been gone for several years and he came back in detroit 
that was when I signed the deal. The deal actually came, and that was sometime in March. So the deal actually came to us um, in February of that year. Now they've been trying to get us to sign it and Bubba wouldn't sign it. So now all of a sudden we go forward and now I've signed it and he hasn't because there's still things that he felt that he had to take care of on his side. By the time he got through that, the company was just like, nah, we don't want it anymore. We're not dealing with the, the headaches. And they decided not to do it. And that's when they said they were So it wasn't, it wasn't like the WWE did a bad thing by us. Let me put it to you this way. They gave us a contract that was great. And at 44 and 45 years of age, I even told Bubba, I said, we need to take the money and just go. We're not going to get an opportunity like this again. We just need to sign this contract, do, an, do another year. If you don't want to do another year after that, then don't do it. I'll go on my own. But, you know, I couldn't make him sign it. But by, by doing that, he took money off the table for not only for himself, but for you as well. And this is what... Yeah, he doesn't see it that way, but that's okay. I mean, you know, I have no animosity against him. Um, I wish him nothing but the best. We do not do business anymore, and uh, there's no hard feelings. I don't have any animosity towards him. It's just that he's doing his thing, and I'm doing my thing. And that's the way I like it, you know. I want to be my own entity. I want to be my own person. I want to be, you know, people call me for autograph signings or what have you. I want to be able to do it on my own. I don't want anybody to mess it up for me or do anything. I want to do it on my own. And that's what I'm doing now. Well, and you know what, though? And it, it's a shame that it turned out that way. But like you said, though, right now you're with the, the one of, you know, the best wrestling company in, in the country. You're the WWE. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you're making a difference in the talent of the future. And that's, and that is something to be said, uh, you know, because. 5, 10, 15 years from now, when these guys are the, are the future of the business, they're, they're going to say where they get their start from, they're going to say from you. So that's, and that, I think that's the, one of the most important things you have to look at. Uh, I, do have, I do have one bone to pick with you, and I, it's because you are a New York Jet fan. And, um, <laughs> and, and you know, your, 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 quarterback, your, your quarterback for this year finally showed up to camp this past week. I have to, I have to ask you, how you feel about the fact that the Jets missed out on Trevor Lawrence and then now have Zach Wilson and they're picked to finish 30th in the NFL this year as, as a, as a guy who has to be in the condition to perform, you know, football is, you know, a lot of guys who used to play football go into pro wrestling. How do you look, mm -hmm. how do you like your, how do you look at your Jets right now, man? It's, it's, I told you I was going to bust your chops when we first talked. I was going to talk, bust your chops about the Jets. So. Listen, people have been busting my chops since 1978. Okay. <laughs> I go way back to the days of Richard Todd, Freeman McNeil, uh, Wesley Walker, <laughs> Joe Pecco, Mark Gatineau. You know, that's when I first started watching the Jets, and I was disappointed from that point. You know, uh, I remember as a child, uh, when I first started watching the Jets, the reason why I picked the Jets wasn't because it was a New York thing. At the, I was too young to realize, oh, that's the New York Jets, you know? That's my whole yeah. team. So I, I was just, hey, they were the Jets. And I thought the green and white was cool at the time. That's why I chose the Jets to be my team. Whenever I turned on the TV back then, that's also it was the Jets. So guess what? As a kid, it programmed in my head to be my team. And I've been stuck with it ever since. Even when they went one in fifteen, I stuck with them. I never tried to jump ship or anything like that. Um, you know, in terms of what they're doing with the draft picks and all that, I'm not really good with all that stuff. I will <laughs> say that they've been messing up since I've been a fan. So hopefully something comes out of this. I just let me put it this way. I just turned forty nine. I'm hoping like some of the older people that I've seen on the news like in Cleveland and all that, say, I just want to see the Jets win the Super Bowl before I die. That's all. I want to be able to say I was here when they won. It was <laughs> a good I mean, you know, just when we, I mean, we've had great quarterbacks over the years. Uh, they might have came from other organizations, but they never were able to pick up that, you know, that success that they had with other teams. Either they were too old or they just didn't have it anymore. I mean, listen, the Jet fans have been let down year after year. We, we, we've been living with our crying towel. We're like, we're like Cleveland, you know, before LeBron got there. 
and won a championship. We've been crying every year. And I think that if we didn't cry every year, it wouldn't feel normal. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Listen, I, I, I still love them, though. I still love them, and I still will support them. I'm that diehard Jet fan, even though year after year, it's a big disappointment. Uh, listen, I I got to cover the Giants through a three and thirteen season. I never. It was almost like team officials were carrying bottles of whiskey to the games. So they <laughs> took it. It was bad, man. A championship with the Giants, and at least because they won numerous within our lifetime. I, I wasn't even born when the Jets won in 68, so I have no idea what New York went through. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, my, one of my last questions for you is, what do you think was the more, um, I guess, gratif- gratifying time for you? Was it in the WWE back in the, during the Attitude Era? Was it when it was an ECW and you had a little bit more creative freedom with what you guys were doing? Or is it what you're doing right now? Well, I'm going to probably have to say probably one of the best times I had was ECW. And it was the Attitude Era, too. I mean, you have to understand, in ECW, um, we were able to, like you said, have a little bit more creative control over what we did. There was no time restraint. We, did, we went out there and did whatever we wanted to do. Just take a look at the promos that we did. I mean, hell, you can only tell so many people to shut the F up and, you know, as Bubba would say, teach their daughter how to Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, it's one of those things where ECW got it was my start. And it was one of those things where I was scared to death when I got there. But then I wind up being the first one to swing a chair and put people through flaming tables, you know? So I couldn't have <laughs> been that much of afraid. But the attitude, that was something special. That really was. That was a time I don't think that the wrestling world will ever see again. I mean, if you just knew the, the, just how good of a time that was and what each and every one of us, you know, brought to the table at that time and how successful we were. Listen, I tell people all the time, every single person during the Attitude Era was over. I mean, they were over like a million bucks from Funaki up to Austin. Yeah. Everybody had a storyline. The one thing about it is that when that music hit, you knew who was coming out. There was no who's that or what have you. You knew it. And I, I'll never forget it. Me, we all went out. We all went to, um, I think it was China. Was it China? Or South Korea, South Korea. We were over there. And I remember Funaki's music hit. And you could have sworn The Rock and Steve Austin came out at the same time. They exploded. I mean, they knew who Funaki was. I mean, it was phenomenal. Not to mention in Italy, I remember little Guido opening up the card uh, with Funaki. And the ovation that little Guido received was like if, as if The Rock and, and Stone Cold Steve Austin had hit the ring. I mean, it was incredible. Everybody was over. Everybody had a storyline. Everybody was making money. Everybody was happy. I mean, that was probably the best time in professional wrestling, not just for the talent, but the fans as well. I I, I don't want to bring up something that will make you upset, but the, uh, Edge yeah, outed man. you. Uh, Edge outed you um, on, on, a, on a podcast a couple of years ago. Um, as great as the TLC matches were, especially uh, WrestleMania X7, he exposed exactly. that. So, something, you know where I'm going, right? He ex- he exposed something that I, that I have the same fear of too. I'm afraid of heights also. He exposed that you're afraid of heights. And then like the thing is, I'm not crazy enough to hold on to the title belts without a ladder hanging there. And you're sitting there hanging in the middle of the air waiting for Edge to, like, or waiting for someone to hit you. <laughs> well, I wasn't waiting for anything. I was waiting for Edge to move the ladder because Jeff Hardy wasn't in his right state of mind and he's kicking the hell out of me. And I'm sitting up there screaming, mm. Jeff, if you ever loved me, you would stop kicking me. <laughs> my brother, that is it moved. And I remember looking down going, oh my God. I said, Edge, move the goddamn ladder now. He goes, Devon, just hold on. I go, I'm not holding on. You guys put me up here with a crazy man. <laughs> To watch that TLC match, when they do the replays of the match at the end of it, 
you see me screaming at Jeff going, stop, stop. <laughs> I'm, talking to Jeff, I'm screaming, stop, because I am petrified of heights. Mm. Look, it took me about three years after being in the WWE to get used to the what's up. Because in ECW, when we did it, I did it on the second row. I never went to the top, and Bubba said, you know, we're in WWE now, so you got to do it from the top. I was just like, oh, boy. <laughs> and I had to condition myself to be able to be comfortable with jumping off the top rope into some man's crotch with my tongue sticking out, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you got paid. <laughs> you, got, you got paid. Um, people ask, but I, I did it for the money. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess one of you know one of the, my favorite situations uh, in wrestling. I always think I always say sometimes what old is, is is still new. And you guys were able to do that ECW One Night Stand 2005 show. Mm-hmm. How surreal was that night? The, the Enter Sandman, you know, for Sandman to come down for, for the Metallica song being played, and you're seeing all the guys there, and it really did feel. Like because I used to watch ECW, and I really just how they were still able to capture that that moment again well, here's the deal vince let us be us that night he let paul lee run the show and that's why it happened that way you know you can't put wwe's twist on ecw it's just not going to work and all, <laughs> which which was proven <laughs> we all saw that when vince tried to bring it back it didn't have the same success i mean you can't you can't do ecw with a watered down version of it yeah. And that's another thing. You'll never see ECW like that again. I mean, we don't have the players that can play like that anymore. Although you look at CZW and all those, those guys with the with the light bulbs and all of that, I mean, it's just, that's not, that's not ECW and that's not what we represented. And although some of them get mad at people like me and other ECW guys because we say, oh, that's not wrestling or what have you. Same people were talking about us the same way. Here's the deal. We helped change the face of pro wrestling. You cannot deny that the Attitude Era was not influenced by ECW. Of course we were influenced because that was why we had the hardcore matches and everything else. Austin drinking the beer, giving the middle finger. That was all done in ECW way before it got to WWE. I don't see anybody emulating CZW. (laughs) And I'm not knocking guys. I'm not knocking them at all. God bless them for what they're doing in that ring, but it's just that's too much for me. I don't consider that wrestling at all. I, I, <laughs> and and the last thing I want to talk to you about was I remember back in 2000 there was a show in Nassau Coliseum where The Rock was not in attendance, and Austin was on the shelf with injury, and you Jericho, B- B- <laughs> Bubba, Big Show, you, and the WWE released this on the best of After Raw. And I was sitting with um, my little guys. Yeah, I was. Yeah. My, I was. I was with my 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 two future stepsons, and we were watching this. And um, you know, they're one seven, one's ten, so they're being introduced. You know, they they, they love wrestling. And um, the seven year old I just spoke to on the phone said he's like, I told him I was interviewing today. He's like, well, tell him I say hi. Uh, but he 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 he's like, well, he danced like we like we saw on TV. I'm like, he usually doesn't dance. He usually yeah. doesn't dance. But that must have been a good self confidence thing for you, for for you and Bubba at the time, and also Jericho, who was still not at that point yet, and Big Show, who was not at that point yet, and Rikishi and Too Cool to knowing that you guys can close out the show and be be able to send the fans home happy. Because well, you know, a lot of people, a lot of fans don't understand what we are like behind the curtain, behind when the cameras are not rolling. And if you took a if you took a camera and started following every one of us back in the Attitude Era around, you would see the personalities just come out. I mean, that was just us. We we did that, and we were, we were out there just having fun. So when everything was said and done, we said to each other, we said, let's just go out there and have fun. Let's just be us. So what you saw that night was us. You got to remember, sometimes Vince doesn't want that, so he can't really show it. But that night, we had the opportunity to show it, and he let us, and that's exactly what we did, which is why it was so successful. 
Yeah. Well, Devon, I know you have to get over to the uh, Performance Center. Uh, you're you're going to be heading there now. I really want to appreciate you. You know, really want to say thank you for giving me a few minutes today. This was an absolute pleasure. I'll definitely let you know thank when you. we are. And, uh, you know, and listen, keep at it. And we thank you for uh, all the years of entertainment that you've been able to give us. And, you know, let's keep rolling with it. Well, thank you. And I continue to, I definitely will continue to do that. And I just want people to know for the record, because I'm sure a lot of people are going to listen to your show and a lot of dirt sheet writers understand this. Bubba and I are not at ends with, we're not at odds with one another. We don't hate one another. We just went different ways like most tag teams do. This is not a Marty Jannetty and Shawn Michaels thing where we hate each other. We, <laughs> we just had different opinions during that time and we went our separate ways. Even the wrestling school. He has the wrestling school in Connecticut. I have the one in Winter Park over here. So, you know, we both individually own our wrestling schools, um, but we just do things separate now. That's all. You know, uh, my kids still call him Uncle Bubba, and, you know, I still, when people ask me, he's still my brother. Well, you know, I'm glad you were able to make that clear because, like, I did think about that saying, well, people are going to really take this out of context. But you know yeah. what? There's, there's nothing to take out of context. You guys are still cool with each other. It's yeah, just. It's and I'm very happy for him on his show at Busted Open Radio. He does a great job. Him, Mark Henry, and Tommy Bremer, and uh, Lagania, I think his name is. That's yeah. on the show. LaGreca, yeah. LaGreca, thank you. And, um, you know, I'm doing good with Table Talk uh, every Wednesday at 4 p.m., you know, on YouTube or Twitch and all that. So we're, we're doing things individually now. I know the fans don't want to see that, but that's just the way it is. A, a, a wise man once told me everything has an expiration date with us. Yeah. Whether it, be, whether it be your marriage, whether it be your life, whether it be good times, everything has an expiration date. 20 years is a long time to be successful, you know, that me and Bubba were being on top of the world. And that came to an end. And nobody wanted to see it. We didn't want to see it, but it happened. And that's the way it is. Hopefully, you know, you know how to do the uh, videos breaking up of the, ban of the bands. Yeah. Uh, so that maybe they'll do that on tag team wrestling. I mean, and people can get both of our opinions on what happened in 2016. I would love for somebody to do that. I even brought that up to creative in WWE. I was about to say, there's your new WWE Network show. That's you, that's, that you get you get the royalties though. That's the deal. I, listen, I want the royalties. As long as me and Bubba don't have to split it, because we're no longer together anymore. So as long as he gets his percentage and I get mine, that's separate. <laughs> yeah. Devon, thanks so much, brother. And listen, we'll be in contact during the football season so we can uh, talk a little trash to each other. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to talk trash. I hope I can be able to talk trash. I, <laughs> I just hope that we just break over 500. <laughs> well, see. Well, listen. When you when you guys come to New York, I'm gonna uh, I'll shoot you a message and uh, may, maybe we'll grab a slice. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I think I gotta get off this diet because you know I got older now and I'm not wrestling, so now it's harder for me to keep the weight off. So I'll make sure that leading up to the time I come back to New York and I get that slice with you, I will diet like there's no tomorrow. So then I won't feel so guilty on my cheat day. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, man. Thanks again so much. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. You take care of yourself. You too. All right, that was Devon Dudley. Very interesting on what he had to say about his relationship with Bubba. No ill will. They just refused to do business with each other anymore. Um, but he sort of told me off the record a little bit more about what was going on, that he wasn't going to elaborate too much more into it. But, you know, it, listen, he works for the WWE now. He's a producer, does a great job. And we thank him for coming on the show, and he's going to come on again. I get to bust his chops about Jets football. So with that being said, um, follow the show, uh, social media, like we stated before the interview. Follow the show on social media uh, at Cut Wrestling BSB and on Facebook at the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. Cut Wrestling BSB is, of course, our Twitter and Instagram. And we are all over the podcast platforms. Check it out now. We always appreciate your support. Give us a five-star review. But until then... We will see you next week here on the Cup Pro Wrestling Podcast. Again, special thanks to Andrew Fumi, Jamie Rush, Alyssa Dokas, um, Alexis Rodriguez, Scott Mitchell, Jonathan Mary, Jose Padilla, Matthew Sargent, all the crew that works behind the scenes here at the Cut. We're making this thing a little bit bigger week by week, and you're going to keep enjoying the things that we're doing. But until then, my name is Randy Zelly with Back Sports Page. Thank you, Andrew Fumi, again, for making us look good as we do and makes us sound as great as we do. Otherwise, we will see you next week here on the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast.